Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled The Three Angels' Messages. So those of you who are regular Seventh-day Adventist Church members, you should all be experts on this because this is supposed to be our key verses in the Bible. We're supposed to be the ones who know the answers to these things and how to explain them, and so, uh, We'll jump into this series. This is number five in that series for April 29 of 2023, entitled, The Good News of the Judgment. Let's pray. Our wonderful Father, as we consider this monumental task you have set, to your, set yourself to try to review the lives and thoughts and words of every single person who has ever lived, uh, we can't even begin to fathom that level of complexity, but there you are with the jury standing by, the devil making accusations. Help us to understand what is going on in the heavenly courts is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. The heavenly universe is very tired of sin. God has to find a way to bring the sin problem, if you want to call it that, to a conclusion once and for all. But God, who loves everyone, cannot do that without a careful demonstration of each person's case. He is determined to save as many as possible. So what's God trying to do? Save as many as possible. Fortunately, the day will come soon when God must choose who will be saved to spend the rest of eternity with him and who will be left behind on the earth, dead at the second coming. God, who knows every detail about us, will judge fairly. He will save and take to heaven every person who is safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity. Now, some people would have a lot of problems with that statement, but I think that's the real truth as we, we study this. This reveals to us that the goodness and grace of God is magnificent. He does the best possible he does the best possible for everyone, including Satan. And we'll see some very interesting words about that as we study here. As we've already seen in Revelation 12, 7 to 12, uh, speaks of the beginning of the rebellion in heaven. You remember the story of how Satan, formerly Lucifer, stood next to the throne of God in heaven and managed to develop a selfish attitude and <clears throat> fomented the rebellion right in heaven. So do we look forward to God's, well, and, and of course, that rebellion is spelled out in, consum in consumpt detail in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, and Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15. Uh, we would encourage you to look at those verses if you are not already familiar with them. So do we look forward to God's judgment when we will cleanse the universe of all traces of selfishness, sin, disease, and death? I mean, that... Shouldn't that be something we look forward to? We and, look forward to a universe without those things. Okay, well, that's what we're talking about. In Romans, let's, let's take an, an, another side look at things here. In Romans 1, 16 and 17, uh, let me just look at those verses quickly. I have complete confidence in, God, in the gospel. It is God's power to save all who be, believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles, for the gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself. It is through faith from beginning to end, as the scripture says, the person who is put right, hold on here, sorry. The person who is put right. Um, it's one line down. Yeah. Well. Put right with God through faith shall live. But the amazing thing is, look what happens next. Almost immediately, what's he talking about? God's anger is revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil of the people who, whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. And what is their sin there? Preventing the truth from being known. What is that all about? God's wrath. Hmm. Why would Paul go straight from talking about the gospel, right? I mean, like these are the first words he writes to the Romans. The gospel. And then immediately he jumps to talking about God's wrath. 
As we've noted on many occasions, we have this idea about God's wrath. It is simply his turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway and have persistently refused God's advances, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own continued rebellious choices. They reap the natural results of their evil thoughts, words, deeds, and separation from God. However, he saves anyone who comes to him. Romans 6.23 tells us, For sin pays its wage, death. But God's free gift is of eternal life, and God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, wow, that's from our Good News Bible. It's very important to recognize that the entire universe is involved in the judgment. Okay, Jim, tell us about this judgment scene. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to, 9 to 10. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow, and his hair was like pure wool. His throne, mounted on fiery wheels, was blazing with fire, and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. Okay, let's hit Mayor up for a second. Who, who would that be? The is there any question about who it is? God. God the Father, yeah, okay, go ahead. There were many thousands of people there to serve him, and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session, and the books were opened. Okay, my translation of the Good News Bible there says people. The real word means just beings, and we would say these have to be angels at this point in time, right? In response to Satan's evil, which began in heaven next to God's throne, God will lay out the truth about everyone who has ever lived on this earth and also about Satan and his evil followers for the entire universe to see and compare. So who are the jury in this case? The unfallen universe. The unfallen universe, the entire unfallen universe. Have what? they been living in a vacuum up until that time? And they just say all of a sudden something happened out there in the universe and, and, and it comes as a surprise. Do they need to relive all this stuff that, that the rest of the universe has been experiencing? No, no. Well, oh, you mean, I mean hasn't the, rest of, the rest of the universe has been watching the whole thing from beginning. So why do they, why do they need to go through this, this uh, experience of, of uh, well, dredging this material the, up? The, po the point of this is if, we, if we, uh, we're going to take time and go through the details, God goes through five different judgments before he comes to an, the very end. Well, you got to John 12, 48, it says, the words I have spoken on will be your judge on the last yeah. day. Okay. You know, he already spoke him. He, he's not, not something he's going to conjure up and, and, and say, uh, state uh, at, at, at some future date. He's already told us what the... What the yeah, uh, the question isn't about whether he spoke it. The question is how we respond. And the question... And the question is how we respond, and the entire unlooking universe says, you're planning to bring some of those sinners up here and they're going to live next door to me? Hold on, wait just a minute. i got to be really, really sure. This isn't, okay, you're in here rent for a year, and then after that I'll throw you out. This where, is, where's the unlooking universe been up until now? No, they've been watching the whole time. So then why do we need to go over it again? Well... It, it's, uh, at least as my view, the thing is, God says, when, when it's finished, when the, when the whole thing, at the end of the third coming, every person alive and dead will have an opportunity to say, yes, we reviewed the evidence, we agree with God's, and we're going to read about how that actually happens, but we agree with the evidence that we are, the ones who are outside, they say this is where we belong, the ones who are inside, yes, this one. There must not be any doubts left at the end of this whole thing about God's justice and, and fairness and so forth. So That's, what do you think, Jim? Uh, but, well, I, th I think some of this stuff is uh, maybe somewhat uh, piling on. I, I think that the rest of the universe is supposed to be rather in, enough intelligent. Uh, they, if, they, I'm assuming that they're uh, observing. Yeah. And we've got, we've got the text like 1 Corinthians 4, 9 and so on yeah. and so forth. They, 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 they've been observing. And our, we, the record says we have some, a guardian angel. Yeah. 
Yeah. Isn't that guardian angel been doing his job? Do, do, do they just keep everything close to the chest, or do they, everybody else get to know about it? Well, that's <laughs> you know? we'll have to wait and find out. Won't of course, we? then we use terms like saved uh, or safe to save. I, that I think it shouldn't be used as a safe to save. Uh, if who's not safe to be healed? The word is to be healed. It's not save. Mm. It's like you're throwing out a, a life preserver and, well, who, uh, who gets to have it? I'm going to yank it away from that guy because I don't know. No, it's, it's who's willing to listen and take instruction. That's yeah. my, it, it's somewhat different paradigm, I think. So one way to look at it, why we're going through the so-called investigative judgment or pre-advent judgment is the, the beings of the rest of the universe are finite. They're probably... That, that, Perhaps they're only looking at, able to look at one place at a time. They may know what's going on in the United States and not know what's going on in, in Russia or China or something. I mean, that, you, that, that's, that's so, so maybe, they have, maybe they have questions about, well, what about Jim over there in the United States? But wh what have they been doing the rest of the time? They make building sand castles on the seashore or something? No, they're seeing other... Other people, other other beings. There are a few billion. But haven't they? Haven't they if, 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 let's take another. They, they know what God is like. They don't know what you and I are like. If they trust, the, if they know what God is like, they would surely have gotten to the point where they judge or trust him. Trust God's judgment. Well, this is the final. This is the final step in that process. Oh. Okay. How about uh, you have gone through schooling, all right? So the final exam comes. There's, a, there's an ultimate review, the final review, and then the exam comes. So this is the final review before the judgment is set. It is done. It is done once happened in the cross. It's going to, done, it's going to happen again. And that this time it's for us. And I believe, to me, yeah, the OK universe, I'm going to show you in a big paranomic view of what really truly really happened in yeah. one time that he is vindicated, that thou, O God, are vindicated when thou speakest. So mm -hmm. that's how I look at it. Well, in response to Satan's evil, which began to have an next to God's throne, God will lay out the truth about everyone who has ever lived on the earth, and also about Satan and his evil followers for the entire universe to see and compare. What choices have we made in life? Do those choices show that we want to be more like Jesus? How well do we think of you would, how well do you think you would fare in a judgment with Jesus as your defense attorney? Satan is your accuser and the jury of the entire universe expecting the truth to be revealed. Zechariah 3, 1 to 5 talks about how this, uh, gives us at least a kind of a picture of how this judgment takes place. Carrie? using Zechariah 3, 1 through 5. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. The angel of the Lord said, Satan, may the Lord condemn you. Satan, may the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. The angel said his heavenly attend to his heavenly attendants, take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. And it's just, it recommends mm -hmm. see Romans 3.23. And that's the verse that says, of course, that we've all sinned. We're all sinners. Okay? Big guy? Oh, yeah. Yes. He commanded the attendants to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and they put the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. This is from the Good News Bible. Okay, surely no one who has made any significant study of the gospel and the Bible would suggest that she or he has lived a perfect life. We are all sinners. We have failed God on numerous occasions. If God chose to do nothing on our behalf, we would all perish. Charles? From the writings of Ellen White, Zachariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies with peculiar force to the experience of God's people in the closing up of the great day of atonement. 
the remnant church will be brought into great trial and distress. Those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus will feel the ire of the dragon and his host. Satan numbers the world as his subjects. He has gained control of the apostate churches. But here is that little com company that are resisting his supremacy. If he could blot them from the earth, his triumph would be complete. Okay, well this is a fairly lengthy passage. Let's go ahead, Duane, you want to take the next section there? Sure. Their only hope is in the mercy of God. Their only defense will be prayer. As Joshua was, was pleading before the angel, so the remnant church with brokenness of heart and earnest faith will plead for pardon and deliverance through Jesus their advocate. They are fully conscious of the sinfulness of their lives. They see their weakness and unworthiness and they look upon themselves as they look upon them. As they look upon themselves, they are ready to despair. The tempter stands by to accuse them, and as he stood by to resist Joshua, he points to their filthy garments, their defective characters. He presents their weakness and their folly, their sins of ingratitude, their unlikeness to Christ, which has dishonored their Redeemer. Now let me interrupt for a second. Can you imagine Satan describing your life in the worst possible terms. That's what we're talking about here. It shouldn't be hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just asking you to think it over. Okay, go ahead, endeavors. Uh, let's see, yes. Um, he endeavors to affright the soul with the thought that their case is hopeless, that the stain of their defilement will never be washed away. He hopes to so destroy their faith that they will yield to his temptations, turn from their allegiance to God, and receive the mark of the beast. Ira, you want to take that next paragraph there? Satan urges before God his accusations against them, declaring that they have, by their sins, forfeited the divine protection and claiming the right to destroy them as transgressors. He pronounces them just as deserving as himself of exclusion from the favor of God. So what does he want to do with us? Take him he wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy everyone who, cho who chooses to be on God's side, okay? Are these, he says, the people who are to take my place in heaven, the place of the angels who united with me? While they profess to obey the law of God, they they kept its have, they, have kept. they kept its precepts have they not been lovers of self more than god no. so he's trying to say satan's trying to say they're like me yeah, yeah. they're no better than me you're not so, fair yeah they right. argue about being fair is, is satan <laughs> uh, they have no place they have not placed their interests above his service they have have they not? Yeah. Yeah, have, they not. Words, have they not placed their own interests above his service? Have they not loved the things of this world? Look at the sins which have marked their lives. Behold their selfishness, their malice, their hatred towards one another. Gordon, you want to take the next one there? The people of God have been in many respects very faulty. Satan has an accurate knowledge of the sins which he has tempted them to commit. Hold on. Satan has a what? An accurate knowledge of the sins which he has tempted us to commit, and he knows that we did it. Yeah, wow. Well, that's not what she says, but he's essentially. And he presents these in the most exaggerated light, declaring, will God banish me and my angels from his presence and yet, re and yet reward those who have been guilty of the same sins? Thou canst not do this, O Lord, in justice. Thy throne will not stand in righteousness and judgment. Justice demands that the sentence be pronounced against them, just like it is against me. Yeah, and who else said that to God? Something like that. Do you remember in Genesis 18, 25? Well, Abraham, Abraham said, said that. Yeah, Abraham said, talking about the destruction of Sodom. You can't do that, if, God. If, if, if there are just a few people down there that are, you couldn't destroy the innocent with the guilty, could you? So. 
here's Satan trying to trying to reproduce that idea. You know, why did uh, Abraham stop asking? He re finally figured out God wasn't going to do it. Yeah. But well, God did it. No. He must have thought. Don't you remember that sting up in Russia? What we found out just recently? It was a it was a natural occurrence. Well, but, God, but God allowed it. Oh, that's a completely different uh, kettle of fish. God, God could have stopped it. Yeah. Of course. How, why do, why so, did he so permit that, the chaos in the universe? Yeah. Well. Go ahead, but while, or I can do, while the followers of Christ have sinned, they have not given themselves to the control of evil. They have put away their sins and have sought the Lord in humility and contrition, and the divine advocate pleads in their behalf. That's from Testimonies, Volume 5, from Ellen White, pages 472 to 474. But God's law stands there repeating for all to see what kind of people are safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity. What authority stands behind the law to enforce its demands? Is God the one who demands the death of the sinner? No. Romans 6.23, what does it say? For the wages of sin is death. Yeah. Sin will ultimately destroy itself and us unless we can escape sin's control and accept God's offer. Let us not deceive ourselves. Everything we have ever done or ever thought or ever said will be reviewed in the final judgment, Satan will accuse every one of us of everything he can imagine. However, Jesus is there to tell the truth about us. So we are changed. What is Jesus able to say about us? Have we followed the guidance of the Holy Spirit? If we have followed his guidance, our relationship to Jesus Christ will lead to good works. The good works do not save us. They are the result of our relationship with him. Uh, Jim? Ken, you've said before that, you know, Satan will say, but, you know, he did all these things, and God mm -hmm. says, yes, that's right, but he's no longer that person. He has yeah. changed. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's, because that's I, sinner. I would say because of Christ's demonstration 2,000 years ago, going through that experience of, of going and ultimately end up on the cross, uh, and of course, we're familiar with Colossians 1, 19 and 20 and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10 and 3, 9 and 10 and so on and so forth. They, the onlooking universe, the angels, came to the conclusion that whatever, whatever God says, or Jesus says, is true. Mm -hmm. I don't think any one of those people, or not people, those in, intelligent creatures need to review an awful lot of this stuff. Yeah, well, the question is, they don't, they don't need, they don't have any questions about God's role. No, it's not an issue. Jesus they, Christ. Tr they could trust, remember God says, he did, God Israel, doesn't listen, ask us to listen. Just, and he's, when, when God says he can be trusted, I think those people, those intelligent creatures uh, should have had things settled in their mind without, yeah. uh, long before whatever's going to happen in, into our future. I, yeah. I think that is, is uh, well, I, what happened to the third of the angels that went with Satan? Well, they had all those intelligence. Yeah, but they've already made their their choice, and we don't know that a portion of them may not change sides again. Yeah, well, we well, don't know that. Ellen quite strongly next. suggests that the two thirds that ended up with God, many of them had questions sure. until the cross. Exactly. So, so at the cross. So, so the they, Old Testament wasn't enough to convince them, apparently. Well, Jim, the problem, the, God doesn't have, I mean, the angels up there don't have a question about God. They have questions about us. Mm, I, I think that if, if God makes a, yeah. if they've learned to trust God, they don't need to ha have a get all into the minutia of, 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 of my No, but my this, is, this is what thoughts. we're told. Uh, I don't think they need to know the minutia. They need to know that each person was brought up and that Gordon didn't slip in the side door. Mm. I, not, not that simple, but I mean, yeah. it's well, it, proof that everybody was... I okay, let, 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 let's... Okay. I don't think God's that arbitrary. What, what do you say to the rich, rich man? He says, do, uh, the, the things you won't do. You don't kill, you don't steal, you don't commit adultery. Uh, you honor your parents, your father and your mother. Um, you don't bear false witness, and you love your neighbor. 
Well, what is the worst bearing a false witness? If we go out and we read passages of the Bible without explaining it, it's particularly in the Old Testament, in the historical books, when it'll explain that God is accused in the Bible of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. Mm -hmm. And we, we read it, 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 God, I have found at least six perhaps seven already, different words that are coming to English as God. Mm -hmm. And that is not Yahweh. Those are other pagan deities. And yet we, we read it on week after week oh, those for how other, many years? Those are other names for God. No, not necessarily. Yeah, well. Well, that's, that's a paradigm shift that we, some of us need to reevaluate. Re and uh, okay. it, 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 to have to, to say God c kills in the past, but he's not going to do it in the future. And when you got, I've got a, at least a, close to 20 texts that says God never changes. Now, what is he doing? He says, learn to be like God. Put this, have this mind in you as is in Christ Jesus. And we, well, why didn't Jesus 2,000 years ago teach us when to kill? Well, you talk about God's, God never changes, but it says right in Genesis 6 that he changed. He, repent, he repented. And you go, you go to 1 Samuel 15 and it says he doesn't change and then it says he did change and then he says it doesn't change right in one chapter. There again, we, we need to reevaluate that stuff mm -hmm. because yeah. those, those things are problems of translation. Yeah. In fact, the General Conference back in 1954 did a book, I have a copy of it and I think you do, called Problems in Bible Translation. Mm -hmm. The general, it was published, it was only one of the few documents that the General Conference pump as, as a publisher of, and nobody knows about I it. I think, this Jim, day. it okay. would be good. You bring up some very good points. I think it would behoove us to perhaps spend some time together. And I do, study too. This. This I do, too. You know? But we go through this stuff week after week after week, and, and uh, God brought this, this plague on them. Uh, we, he brought the flood. We don't explain that that, that is not God's character. Okay. I have uh, a suggestion. If that works well, maybe we choose one because it's not only on here. It's people mm -hmm. all over the world could have yeah. questions. I think it would be very they, good to uh, yeah. dedicate one study. Yeah, no, but, but we're going to do no. we're, we're going to no. with one study we're going to not going to settle yeah. the problem. No, no. Well, <laughs> we 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 have a lot of material to cover today, so let's See, move I'm, on. I'm learning this the most difficult part of learning, is it not? Jim, you need to read the next passage okay. there. Ellen White says, the fact that the acknowledgement, excuse me, the acknowledged people of God are represented as standing before the Lord in filthy garments should lead us to humility and deep searching of heart on the part of, the prof of all who profess his name. Those who are indeed purifying their souls by obeying the truth will have a most humble opinion of themselves. The more closely they view this spotless character of Christ, the stronger will be their desire to be conformed to his image, and the less will they see of purity or holiness in themselves. But while we should realize our sinful condition, we are, excuse me, we are to rely upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effective, excuse me, an effectual plea in our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments founded not upon our merits, but upon his own. Ellen White, Testimonies of the Church, Volume 5. Back up, up a minute, would you please, about, uh, about halfway up there. Um, those who purify their soul by paying the truth, closely... Uh, Anyway, the, uh, Christ our righteousness, and the, the, what does that, that mean? We don't use words like that. Well, those words are in the Bible, and they're, and they're but, people but need to try do? to understand. What does it do? Does, what, is, he, shows us what, he shows us what is right. Is yeah. that, is that a, isn't that a more plain way of saying things? Well, that's what it said there in, in, in Zechariah 3 that Kerry read a little while ago, yeah. We shed the dirty clothes of sin by accepting the free offer from God of forgiveness and salvation. By beholding, we become changed. Carrie? And this is from Mrs. White. It is a law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding, we become changed. 
The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to, love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity of goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest idea, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. And that's from the Great Controversy, page 555, paragraph 1, from Mrs. White. Okay. That is one of the best quotations that Ellen White has ever mm -hmm. done. Those who have had a careful look in the Bible recognize that the books of Daniel and Revelation are especially important to compare. Looking at Daniel 7, compare it with what we are learning in Revelation 14, 6 and 7. This is from Ellen White. When the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. Hmm. They will be given such glimpses of open gates of heaven that heart and mind will be impressed in regard to the character all must develop in order to realize the blessedness which is to be re reward of the pure in heart. Again, Ellen White, and she wrote it from New South Wales. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I know it well. Very you much know the so. Well, huh? As we've already noted, Revelation tells us that the hour of God's judgment has come. It's time for us to judge God and time for God to judge us. However, Revelation does not tell us when that time will come, but Daniel 7 through 9 give us some very good clues. Now, you remember, you remember that uh, William Miller got his ideas about re understanding the Bible. He started out with Genesis 1-1. He says, I'm not going to move on to the next chapter until I'm sure I understand this chapter. And, which, and he got to Daniel 8. And he said, hold on, what is this, 2,300 days? What does that apply to, and so forth? And that's what we're going to try to get into now a little bit. Go ahead. Dwayne. The book of Revelation announces that the hour of his judgment has come, Revelation 14, 7. Revelation does not indicate either the nature of the judgment or the exact time that the judgment begins. But Daniel 7, oh, sorry, but Daniel does. Daniel 7 through 9 is interconnected and clearly reveals both the nature and timing of the judgment. The prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation belong together. Understanding Daniel helps us understand Revelation. When Daniel describes the nature of the judgment in Daniel 7, he describes it in the context of Christ's victory over the despotic powers of this world. Earlier in Daniel 7, Four beasts march across the landscape, oppressing the people of God. According to Daniel 7, 17 and 23, these beasts represent kings or kingdoms. The key words in Daniel 7 are kingdom and dominion. There is a battle for the control of this world. Finally, the little horn power arises as a religio-political power that attempts to change God's law and seeks to rule over the earth. Our attention is then turned from earth to heaven. The Ancient of Days, our Heavenly Father, convenes heaven's judgment hour. The Son of Man, Jesus, joins the Father. In the judgment, it is revealed that Christ is the rightful ruler of the universe. Daniel states, I was watching in the night heavens, or night visions. visions, heavens, the next line. And behold, like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is the everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. It's from Daniel 7, 13 That's and him. 14. 
And that's repeated from our Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Daniel 7, again, 17 and 23. Let's look at, see what the Good News Bible says. Gordon? He said, he said, these four huge beasts are four empires which will arise on earth. Jumping to verse 23. This is the, explana this is the explanation I was given. The fourth beast is a fourth empire that will be on the earth and will be different from all other empires. It will crush the whole earth and trample it down. Good news Bible. This is going to be a powerful beast, right? Mm -hmm. And then coming to Daniel 7, 13 and 14, during this vision in the night, I saw what looked like a human being. He was approaching me surrounded by clouds and he went to the one who was, had been living forever and was presented to him. He was given authority honor and royal power so that the people of all nations, races and languages would serve him. His authority would n last forever and his kingdom would never end. So do we know of any human kingdoms that never end? None. There, there ain't none. There, there, there ain't none, huh? Okay, Jim. From the Bible study guide, in the judgment in front of the entire universe, Christ is revealed as its rightful ruler. Satan's kingdom is fully exposed as evil, deceptive, selfish, and destructive. Heaven reveals that the Godhead did everything possible to save all humanity at the cross. The little horn power that is papal Rome and all earthly power powers are condemned to the in the judgment. Judgment is passed in favor of the people of God. As a consequence, the work of judgment also is entrusted to them during the millennium, the millennial reign with Christ in heaven after the second coming. For committed Christians, loyal to Christ, trusting his grace and clothed in his righteousness, the judgment is good news, but not, but bad news. Not bad. Not good news. <laughs> it's good news, not bad news, excuse me. The poem of the Bible study guide, number 66. Take a careful look at the words in Daniel 7. What does Daniel 7 teach us about how this judgment takes place and what the results will be? Carrie? Daniel 7, verses 26 and 27. Then the heavenly court will sit in judgment, take away his, and in brackets, the little horn's power, and destroy him completely. The power and greatness of all the kingdoms on earth will be given to the people of the supreme God. Their royal power will never end and all rulers on earth will serve and obey him. It's from the Good News Bible. Charles? <clears throat> the destiny of all humanity is decided in the heaven's courtroom. Right prevails. Truth triumphs. Justice reigns. This is one of the most amazing most marvelous, most spectacular sins in all the scriptures. And the good news is that it ends very well for God's faithful people, those clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Duane? Jesus approaches his heavenly Father in the presence of the entire universe. Heavenly beings crowd in around the throne of God. The entire universe of unfallen beings stands in awe of this judgment scene. The long conflict that has been waged for millennia is soon to be over. The battle for the throne of the universe is fully, completely decided. From our Bible study guide for Tuesday, God will save or heal every person that has ever lived who is, is safe to live next door to for the rest of eternity. So he, we don't change at the, t at the time of the resurrection, at the time of the second coming. We go home with the characters that we have developed at that point in time. So, can they, can they change some after that? Well, they learn, uh, they will ch change, I'm sure, but it, it, the point is, God can't admit, to so can't admit somebody to heaven who's gonna start the great controversy all over again. Well, That's, those that are going to go to heaven were, would be those that have chosen to listen. Mm -hmm. the, the basic precept is to listen. Well, this, and that's what, using, what was it in Mark and, 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 and excuse me, uh, Deuteronomy uh, 6, yeah. is, is to listen. Yeah. But if you don't want to listen, 
What can God, anybody do for you? What, what, what we have to recognize that's really important, as you're point, starting to point out, there are two parts of listening. One part is, do you hear it and understand it? And the other part is, does that become a part of your life? And that's part of the listening. Well, listening is done really of no, uh, no efficacy if you don't have any intention. Well, uh, I'm not arguing about that. I'm just saying we, experts recognize that there's two parts to listening. Okay, Satan is still trying to exert his power even though he knows that his fate is sealed. I just uh, listened to a person who's talking about the issues in the Great Controversy. Well, not so much the Great Controversy, but the, particularly about the issues between um, Christianity and evolution. And he quotes James 2, where it says, the devils tremble with fear because they know the truth about God. And he says, even the devil is not stupid enough to be an atheist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, we're talking about third coming now, though. This well, is third coming. It, 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 the final result is at the third. The final result is at the third coming. That's right. correct. What we are, what we're studying right now is the third coming. No, the, the, this is happening at the second time coming because at that time God has to choose. Okay, who's going to go to heaven and who's going to be left here to die, and that's not going to change at the third coming. The third coming. I mean, third coming is the climactic event. Yes. Destruction of the, the city comes down from heaven, and right. God God moves His kingdom from. And He touches the earth. Then also the third coming, second coming, He does not. Well, the you know that's an issue that we could dispense spend some time talking about, and I'm not going to take either no, no, side no, on don't it. Don't worry, don't worry. Uh, but what I tell people is, Satan. We know that Satan himself is going to try to come and claim that he's Jesus Christ. And I just have, for all of you out there listening and those here in this room, I just have a very simple explanation of how to be. If someone claims that they're Jesus Christ and they have arrived, all you have to do is look up. Because when the real Jesus comes, the entire heavens are going to be full of bright, shining angels. And Satan will never be allowed to duplicate that. Amen. So that's the, I think that's more important than whether he touches the ground or not. Okay, Bible study guide. Yes, Daniel was right about the empires that came and went, just as predicted. Why then does it make so much sense to trust the Word of God about what it says regarding the final one, the everlasting kingdom, that shall never pass away? Revelation 4 also gives us a look at the throne room in heaven. Compare these words with the words of Daniel 7. This is from Revelation 4, verses 2 through 4. At once the Spirit took control of me. There in heaven was a throne with someone sitting on it. His face gleamed like such precious stones as jasper and carnelian, and all around the throne there was a rainbow of color of an emerald. In a circle round the throne were 24 other thrones on which were seated 24 elders dressed in white and wearing crowns of gold. And that's not, the, uh, tr uh, the victory crowns, not the royal crowns. Yes, these are crowns of victory. They, they run the race and they, they won. Notice that there are 24 elders dressed in white, wearing crowns of gold and surrounding the throne of God. These crowns are crowns of victory, not kingly crowns. That's diadems. Who, of these tw who are these 24 elders? We should note that the term elders, those who are older, that's what the term means, is only used in the Bible to describe human beings. This tells us that some human beings will be allowed to sit around the throne of God in heaven and to participate, presumably, in the judgment. So far, we have noticed that a judgment scenes with God sitting on the throne in Daniel 7, Revelation 4, and we could add Zechariah 3. Now look at Revelation 5, and these verses is a possible solution and also a significant problem. Look at Revelation 5, 1 to 3. I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. Okay, who ha who's holding this, this, this scroll? Jesus. No, it's not Jesus. Who's holding the scroll? The one who sits on the throne, so God the Father? It has to be God the Father because look what comes next. 
It was covered with writing on both sides, was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel who announced in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But there was no one in heaven or on earth or in the world below who could open the scroll and look inside it. So now I'm going to ask several questions. Who sealed the scroll? Why is it being held in the hands of God? What does that mean? And reading on, Jim. Revelation 5, verses 5 to 12. Then one, on, excuse me, then one of the elders said to me, Don't cry. Look, the lion from J Judah's tribe, the great descendant of David, has won the victory, and he can break the seven seals and open the scroll. Then I heard a, excuse me, then I saw a lamb standing in the center of the throne, surrounded by four living creatures and the elders. The lamb appeared to have been killed. It had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God that have been sent throughout the whole earth. The lamb went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. Okay, so I want to interrupt here for just a moment. Notice, the lamb takes it from the one who's sitting on the throne. So we're talking about the Son, Jesus Christ, takes it from the Father, okay? Go ahead. Um, as he, as did, he did so, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each had a harp and gold bowls f f filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. They sang a new song you are worthy to take the scroll and to break this, open its seals. For you killed... You were killed. You were killed brutally, and by your sacrificial death, you bought for God people from every tribe, language, nation, and race, and have made them a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they shall rule on earth. And again I looked, and I heard angels, thousands and millions of them, they stood around the throne, the four living creatures and the elders, and sang in a loud voice. The lamb who was killed is worthy to receive power, wealth, wisdom and strength, honor, glory and praise from the Good News Bible. Okay. I just want to notice, want to notice there is in that the word there used to describe he was killed some religions and some pastors try to say, well, he was, he was offered as a sacrifice on an altar. No, this word means brutally slaughtered. Yep. This means he, he wasn't just sacrificed. He was brutally slaughtered. Yep. Is there any reason for fear? Don't you think Jesus is a successful defense attorney? The purpose of this whole process is not to find out how bad we are, but to reveal how good God is. Jesus himself had some very interesting words to say about the judgment process. Carrie? John chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. <coughs> Pardon me. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged, because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light, because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay, so God's judgment that we've been talking about just seems, okay, he's going to demonstrate, based on the records which are there, that some people have chosen against him and some people have chosen for him. And that's described in John as those who love the darkness and those who love the light. <clears throat> Coming to the light particularly important, it is particularly important in these final days of this world's history. Charles? This is from Ellen White. Those who endeavor to obey all commandments of God will be opposed and derided. They can stand only in God. In order to endure the trial before them, they must understand the will of God as revealed in His Word. They can honor him only as they have the right conception of his character, government, purposes, and all 
in accordance act with in them. accordance and act in accordance with them none but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the bible will stand through the last great conflict beautiful statement mm -hmm. to every soul will come the searching test shall i obey god rather than men the de decisive hour is even now at hand are our feet planted on the rock of god's immutable word are we prepared to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 593. Very good. That's a very, very significant passage. Yes. And Daniel 7, 22. Then the one who had been living forever came and pronounced judgment in favor of the people of the Supreme God. The time had arrived for God's people to receive royal power. So often we think of judgments as being opposed. They're, they're condemning somebody who's made something, done something wrong. It's really important to see in this case that the judgment here is focused on those who have done, tried to do right, that are on God's side, and he, he judges in favor of them. This is not just a single person like that's being judged and often found guilty. These are, we're talking about millions of people and a lot of them are going to be judged to have followed God's will. Again, dwell on the great hope that we have in the judgment. Jesus as our substitute, why is that our only hope? Okay, so now, what does the idea of a substitute mean? Jesus stands by our side in the judgment and does everything he truthfully can do to represent on us before the onlooking universe. He does this in response to Satan's charges again against us, and we read about that earlier in Zechariah 3. So what will be the condition of God's faithful people at the end? Has the study of Revelation 14, 6, and 7 had any major impact on your life? Are you prepared to understand it carefully and tell others about it? Of course, as we suggested earlier, the ultimate message from Revelation 14 is to tell the truth about God in response to Satan's accusations as recorded in Revelation 13. So how do you see this whole judgment process taking place? Are you comfortable that you understand it? From the Bible Study Guide, it says, when many Christians consider the judgment, they tend to be filled with fear. They envision God in his celestial co courtroom, sitting as a supreme judge of the universe, weighing their good deeds against their bad deeds. They have this vague notion, notion that if their good deeds outweigh their bad, they will be saved. If, perchance, their bad deeds outweigh the good deeds, they will be lost. And this is the basic teaching of the Catholic Church. Roman Catholic Church, yes. But fortunately, we can get some of those merits, according to uh, some. Uh, yes. So continuing from the Bible study guide, in this week's lesson, we will discover that this view of the judgment is not only false, but it, also, but it is also one of the devil's deceptions to distort the character of God. Satan desires to picture God as a vindictive judge, some sort of wrathful tyrant who wants to punish his creatures for every sin they have ever committed. Our Sabbath School study guide this week reveals a God of unending love who is doing everything he can to save us, to heal us, as Jim would encourage us to save. The, the Greek word for save also means heal. He wants us in heaven even more than we want to be there. The judgment attests to the divine reality that heaven has done everything it can to save all humanity. If we are lost, it will be because we have continually resisted the claims of divine love. In the judgment, our good deeds are important because they reveal our response to the unconditional, exhaustive love of God as revealed in Christ on the cross. Exhaust list, I'm sorry. Our good deeds testify to the fact that our faith in Jesus is genuine. Our recognition of what Jesus has done is doing, has done, is doing, and will continue to do, leads us to desire to serve him better. From our Bible study guide, page 65. 
Tim? Ellen White says Satan sees that his voluntary rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. He has trained his powers to war against God. The purity, peace, and harmony of heaven would be to him a supreme torture. His accusations against the mercy and justice of God are now silenced. The reproach which he has endeavored to cast upon Jehovah rests wholly upon himself, and now Satan bows down and confesses the justice of his sentence. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 670. And not only Satan, but look at what about the, his followers. Carrie? This is from Mrs. <coughs> <Pardon me. coughs> That's from Mrs. White. Could those whose lives have been spent in rebellion against God be suddenly transported to heaven and witness the high, the holy state of perfection that ever exists there? Every soul filled with love, every countenance beaming with joy, enrapturing music and melodious strains rising in honor of God and the Lamb and ceaseless streams of light flowing upon the redeemed from the face of him who sitteth on the throne. Could those whose hearts are filled with hatred of God, of truth and holiness, mingle with the heavenly throng and join their songs of praise? Could they endure the glory of God and the Lamb? No, no, years of probation were granted them that they might form characters for heaven, but they have never trained the mind to love purity, they have never learned the language of heaven, and now it is too late. A life of rebellion against God has unfitted them for heaven. Its purity, holiness, and peace would be torture to them. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. They would long to flee from that holy place. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. And that's from the Great Controversy, page 542. Okay, we're about run, to run out of time, but those two statements should make it very clear that we judge ourselves by our response to God's will and so forth. Those who are outside chose to be there. Those who are inside chose to be there. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow before you once again, thanking you immensely for, for grace that we don't deserve, but which we gra gladly receive. Help us to understand clearly that we are the ones who determine our own destiny. It's not some separate process that takes place somewhere behind closed doors, but that the entire universe is free to observe and everyone would agree that your choice, your, your list uh, of the saved is correct. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.